One of the most worrisome parts of the pandemic is the number of cases experienced by African Americans. So why so many? That is something that UConn's Dr. Cato Lorenza, Lorenzen rather, has been researching. He spoke about it in depth in the most recent episode of the program, The Road to a Vaccine with Lisa Ling. And he is joining us now to talk about the findings of his study. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And you have some new information with uh, regard to the state of Connecticut, new numbers you just have put together on a graph that really do show the death rate is much higher in African-Americans. Yeah, so we actually, uh, just as a backdrop to this, we published the first paper really exam examining uh, COVID-19 in blacks. Uh, this was uh, earlier you know, in, the, in the month. And we actually wrote the paper and explored this because uh, on the internet at the time, uh, there was a question of whether blacks were immune to, uh, to coronavirus or can't get coronavirus. And this has really frightened us in terms of, in terms of that, that type of story, that sort of type of rhetoric being placed on the internet and social media. And in, our, in the, this first paper that, that was published, we looked at data at the, from the end of March, um, really demonstrating that blacks uh, were uh, contracting the coronavirus and dying at a higher rate. Uh, we've gone back, and this is a work uh, that's in conjunction with Dr. Jamie Grady, who's at the head of our biostatistics unit at our, at our institute, and Joanne Walker. We went back and looked at every single day um, in terms of the rates of death, uh, the death statistics, and created uh, basically new curves looking at death, death uh, levels and really found the levels to be consistently high uh, among uh, blacks during that entire, during the last entire month. In fact, we've just created a new graphic, which we'll, we'll share with you at some point, uh, which has that, uh, that, uh, those data. Why is this happening? Well, we, we know uh, there are a number of things that uh, contribute to this. First is the issue of health care. Uh, we know that, and that has two parts, uh, you know, uh, one that may be, one that's known and one may, that may not be as, as well known by people. And that's uh, obviously access to care is different. Uh, blacks have, um, uh, have are two times uh, have two times the rate of, uh, of not having health insurance, which makes a difference. But there's also the factor about what happens when blacks actually enter the healthcare system. And we know that uh, between whites and blacks, blacks get, aren't treated the same as whites in terms of our healthcare system and are treated more poorly. Uh, you know, we call this unconscious bias. Uh, some people call it conscious bias, but the point is that blacks are not treated as well in the healthcare system. And that reflects on their um, on their outcomes in terms of the clinical problems. Um, the second area is where blacks live and, 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 and work. And uh, for instance, 60% of nurses aides actually are black. Uh, nurses aides working in uh, nursing homes are, are black. And so the types of conditions and places uh, blacks are working uh, has a factor. But the, the other factor, which is the other factor is living, being a black person living in America, uh, the weathering effect or the distressing effect of living in, in America. I just published a paper about two weeks ago on racial profiling and its medical effects and the, the types of medical effects that take place with racial profiling can be profound. And so everyday life for black people has its stress and those stress you know, uh, actually have medical consequences. And then the third, of course, is the comorbidities and the other diseases such as diabetes, asthma, um, hypertension. But these are all linked into the first two things, the, the healthcare system and also linked into uh, the life of being black in America. Doctor, I know we have limited time, but I do want to make sure I ask this question to you. Do you know of any interventions that you think could start being done right now that would change that curve? Well, I think the first intervention is testing. Uh, there's a there's a, a old rule. If you don't take a temperature, there is no fever. Uh, we have to do uh, testing in the black community. If we if we know that the 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 uh, higher number of cases are in the black community, so we should have extens extensive testing in the black community. We should be doing uh, quarantine and then tracer technology, tracer where we trace the next generation of individuals uh, that, are the, that, uh, have that, uh, that uh, contract the disease. And finally, I've advocated for early intervention in terms of early, uh, in early hospitalization. And it doesn't even have to be a hospital. I was talking to, to colleagues in uh, Equatorial Guinea uh, last, uh, uh, last night about their program. Every person that's actually diagnosed with with coronavirus, they go into a uh, either a hotel setting in which they're uh, being you know, cared for, or a hospital setting they're they're being cared for uh, very early on uh, to get care uh, to try to avoid being on a ventilator to try to avoid the sort of excessive level of care that's necessary for people 
who actually are, um, are very, very sick with coronavirus. And so I'm advocating that the early intervention, early care it could be a pop-up tent hospital, pop-up tent clinic uh, for individuals with coronavirus. Uh, I think that's what they're also needed in terms of the communities. Dr. Cato Lorenzen, I know we can hear more from you and learn more uh, in the show Road to the Vaccine, but we thank you for coming to us, and especially uh, since you are here locally and have the pulse on what's happening right here in Connecticut. We appreciate your time. Thank you.